everybody to the Brightest Show, and I'm here to introduce you to our esteemed panel, which is really cool. These people all drove in here to be with you all. Uh, our moderator tonight is Carrie Ferguson, who uh, teaches theater at Wadford College and directs plays and knows a lot about children's literature, and so we're excited to have her. Samantha Bell is from over in Tigerville, and uh, she's going to tell you about the kinds of publishing she does. It's on the bio, guys. You can look at the bio. And um, Melinda Long, originally from Spartanburg, now in Greenville. Um, she has written uh, several books. Some of you, met, you have heard of them. How, How I Became a Pi Pirate is one of those. Kate Sally Palmer has published, what, 12 books? Um, uh, so. Seven books. Um, Kate uh, has her own publishing company, and um, we have her here so she can talk a little bit about that. Uh, Dinah Johnson has come from Columbia, and she has published with some uh, major publishers, including Henry Holt. And um, so we have a really wide variety of experiences here, and we did that on purpose. Um, folks that are publishing with big six publishers, folks that have figured out how to do it themselves, folks that are publishing with um, middle range publishers. So it's my pleasure to turn the microphone over to Carrie Burns. So nice to have you here. I've enjoyed uh, getting to know you uh, most of you before I came over. And I'm excited to sort of start to share your stories with the uh, people who have joined us here tonight. And thank you so much for coming on this busy night in Spartanburg. Um, I think I'm just going to sort of start with a really broad question to get us going. Um, we have um, a large panel of four this time around, so um, I'll try to get through just a couple of questions, and each one of you can just sort of pass the mic for the easiest way to do it. Um, uh, so Dinah has the microphone, so why don't you start us off? <laughs> um, the first question I sort of have is just how you found your way to writing literature for children, or for illustrating for children, because um, some of you both write and illustrate um, for children's literature or picture books, um, and then how you found your way to the sort of, to, to be published. So how did you get into children's literature, and then sort of at the tag at the end of that, how did you figure out how to get your book out into the world? Good evening, everyone. I do need this, right? Do I need it? Yes. Okay, I'm happy to be here. Yeah, I, um, I make my living as an English professor, but what I love doing is writing children's books. I started writing when I was in the sixth grade, and my teacher took me seriously. And in college, I was a creative writing major, but then when I went to grad school, I couldn't really do the creative writing along with the critical stuff. But I, um, that was always my dream, so the way I got published, and then how, how you found your, your way into the world. Okay, the way I got into children's books is not a way you can get in these days. I got in by sending out my manuscripts without being asked. I didn't meet publishers at conferences. I did not have an agent. I was just sending them out. And my agent inherited, not my agent, my editor, Christy Ottaviano, inherited an office that had a big slush pile and one of my stories was in the slush pile and she called me and now she's published six of my books so that was serendipity and it was wonderful but now I need to find an agent because because I need to have more than one publisher because Christy doesn't like everything I write <laughs> um, what was the rest of the question That's it. so you just need to diversify right yeah. I was just gonna say that then I think it's easier to get an agent, I mean, to get a, a publisher than it is to get an agent. I mean, it's harder to get a publisher than it is to get an agent. Because if you've got a publisher, you're going to get an agent. You, 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 no problem. You're going to find them. All you got to do is tell them you published. Um, and they'll stand in line. I was a political cartoonist for the Greenville News for about 10 or 15 years, and and when I and I was nationally syndicated, and when I stopped doing political cartoons, I was hanging out with, with people who were friends of mine who were teachers, and they showed they took me to children's bookstore bookstores, which I never would have looked into really. Um, and um, I saw a book 
that looked as if it had been illustrated by a friend of mine, a cartoonist. It wasn't, but it was uh, called The Relatives Came by Cynthia Rowland. And um, that book inspired me to write The Pink House. And I wrote and illustrated The Pink House, and I sent it. It, uh, it was in slush funds, uh, slush, uh, slush funds, <laughs> slush piles, slush piles all over New York. Um, and um, Simon and Schuster picked it out, and they wanted to publish it. But before they wanted, before they wanted to publish this, they wanted me to illustrate a book that someone else had written, so that they could see if I could illustrate a book because I'd never done one before. And um, that was the uh, How Many Feet in the Bed by Diane Johnson Ham. And um, <clears throat> then I wrote uh, A Gracious Plenty, which Simon and Schuster liked a lot and said that they didn't need to edit it very much. So they, they published that. So I had two books published with Simon and Schuster and they, they backed off a little bit after that. They said, well, we'll do this one later. Well, then they got sold and all the people left. And, um, and long story short, A Gracious Plenty went, went out of print. And, um, so we decided, we got the rights back and decided to form our own publishing company um, and um, publish A Gracious Plenty and, um, and The Pink House. And we, um, that, that's, that's how I got to start doing children's books. Thanks, Melinda. Thank you. It's interesting that you both ended up in a slush pile, but you, you got out of the slush pile, which is really unusual. It really is. Um, I was lucky enough to get an agent um, after 12 years of trying to send stuff off to publishers. So if you're thinking that it's gonna happen next week, it's not. If you're sending stuff off, keep sending stuff off. And you know, don't, don't imagine just because one person doesn't like your work that somebody else won't. Other people will. Um, publishers are looking for different things. I started out, I love to tell the story that I started out writing when I was six, and it really is true. My mother got me started when I was about six years old because I loved to write, but at that time I loved to just tell stories. I didn't want to write anything, but she gave me her typewriter, and I used the typewriter to write my first story. And that was kind of fun, um, and I just kept doing it over and over and over, telling stories, writing them down. Um, when I went to college, I went to college to teach, which I did for 23 years taught middle school, I loved it. But during that time, I was also sending off manuscripts. For the, so for the first 12 years of my marriage, my husband is encouraging me to write. I had really great teachers and really great college professors that introduced me to books like Where the Wild Things Are and Ira Sleeps Over, and I just love those books. And I kept thinking, these are the most wonderful books in the world. And so, at one point in time, I finally met an agent who liked my work. And I'm still with him, by the way. I'm with two different agencies because uh, he was with one agency and left that agency to go with another agency. Um, so they still represent my older stuff. But he's wonderful. And he um, found publishers. I went through Simon & Schuster first for my first two books, When Papa Snores and Hiccup Snick Up. Had a really great time with those. They didn't stay in print that long. They, uh, when Palmer Stores stayed quite a while, but then it went out of print. About the time that my third book, How I Became a Pirate, came out, and it did really well, and fortunately for me, timing is everything, folks. Um, I sent the book in. We went through the process with Harcourt about going through all this business about, you know, let's find the right illustrator, let's find the right person to do the book. It took six and a half years between the time I was finished writing the book until the time it actually came out on the shelves. During that time frame, at some point, somebody at Harcourt said, hey, isn't Disney releasing a pirate movie? Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> so like I said, timing is everything. Uh, Pirates of the Caribbean came out, and um, my book came out a couple of months later. And boy, talk about lucky. Everybody was pirate crazy, and so the pirate books did really well. And one day, my children walked in the room doing this business. And of course, they were 12 and 16, and I had no clue what that was. Mom, look! I don't get it. It was an eye patch, okay? Look, pirate peekaboo. <laughs> okay, so Pirates Don't Change Diapers was born. And there is a third pirate book 
that's on the waiting list right now. We will see when it comes out. I have no earthly idea. Uh, 12 Days of Christmas came out sometime in between there. 12 Days of Christmas in South Carolina, which uh, Sterling Press was doing this entire um, series of all the different states. And they asked me to write that one, so that was fun to write. I got to put all my favorite South Carolina stuff in there. Um, kudzu, sweet tooth, the kind of thing. Anyway, like I said, just, you know, you really have to stay with it. If you're going to write, it takes a long time to get somebody's attention if you're going through the traditional route. Um, well, I, I wrote a story on typewriter, too, when I was about six, and then in school, I, well, I, I took art lessons from a private teacher and then got into music in middle and high school in college, and then I studied history, let's show you how, how many directions you can go, and um, I got my teaching certification because I thought, what else do you do with history, and, but I wasn't really planning on being a teacher, but I couldn't find a social studies position, so I did temporary work and then for a recertification I took a children's literature class and I was looking through the picture books and I thought, this can't be that hard. I can do this. <laughs> so then like ten years later I finally finally do. But um anyway so I, I just went to the library, got books from the library, how to write children's books, how to illustrate children's books, because I was gonna illustrate my own. And I made up this little story and and did some illustrations and I just read the direction how you send it in. And I sent in, and I got a favorable response. And they said, you know, they just maybe need some tweaking. And I, oh, wow. And so, like, a week later, I sent the revision, which is super speedy fast. Publishers aren't really expecting that. And the, um, the assistant editor who liked it, she was gone. And so that was, that was kind of the end of that one. But in between there, when I was working on it, I did see in, um, I think it was the South Carolina Living Magazine, there was an illustrator in Seneca, so I did contact her and say, oh, can you help me with these pictures? You know, can you give me some tips? And so she said yes, and I went and had a few lessons with her. Well, then I got the rejection, and I kept sending things out and kept getting rejections. And then our children, we have four, and I think I was doing all this when we just had one, and the second one came along, so I just kind of shelved everything. And we homeschool, and even when they're little, if you homeschool, you are homeschooling from the beginning, it feels like. You know, you all feel like, oh, I've got to be teaching and things and going on little field trips and things. So I got really busy. And then my high school friend, she um, got her master's in genetic, genetics, I think, in genetic biology. And she was becoming a stay-at-home mom for the first time, and she didn't know what to do with herself. So she liked to write. So she started writing, and she's, she's in New York. And she said, well, join this online critique group with me. I said, well, okay. So I was really nervous. And these, um, everybody was, they were all spread out all over the United States. Uh, there were six women, including myself. So I joined it, and it was really helpful. And I thought, wow, I really need help with my writing. <laughs> there are things I need to tweak. And so I did that for a number of years and started submitting again and getting more rejections. But, but it was really helpful. And actually, I'm still, that particular friend, she's had to drop out. But there are still four of us in this critique group for the last 10 years online, and we've never met each other. Um, and we still live all over the country. But, um, it, but they've become very close friends, you know, just through all these critiques, and we're, we share things about our personal lives and everything, too, with each other. Anyway, so I kept going, and then um, at the time, there's this group called SCBWI, Society of Children, Books, Writers, and Illustrators. And at the time, they were having monthly contests to win membership, which I think was $60. Well, we were a very tight budget, so I would try every month to win that membership by, with an illustration, and I never won. And so then finally, I bit the bullet. And I, well actually, I went to my first conference in Greenville where Melinda was speaking. And <laughs> after that, I bit the bullet and I joined. And um, there's so many resources, which I think we'll talk about the organization later, but they have so many resources and I started getting connected with people. And it was that year, it was a really hard year for my family, personally. But on the flip side, it was a really good year for me, publishing-wise, because I, I was submitting to magazines and I was starting to get accepted. And there was a history magazine. Every time I sent them something, I, they accepted it, which was really rewarding. They've since gone out of print, but, um, but that's where I started. I started with magazines, but I did have my copies. But, um, so I started with magazines and articles and I had poems, and mostly there's, there were some online ones, which are not around anymore, but there are some that still are, and often they're easier to get into. 
And then you have a publishing credit, because on your letter you want to write down all your publishing credits, and all of those things count. And some, when I start illustrating, I did some online illustrations for free for a children's magazine that's gone now too. <laughs> but anyway, it was a good experience, and I can write it down on my resume. So I started with magazines, and um, then I, I was doing illustrations too, and then a friend of mine saw this call for illustrators from a small publisher. It's just um, the little online thing, so I just sent them a link to my illustrations I have on the website. And about four months later, they called, or they emailed me and said, we have a project you might want to do. I said, yes, yes, yes. And I didn't. I mean, it's through email. <laughs> they were all caps. Yes, yes, yes. And then they sent me um, a, a story and said, illustrate a page. So I did send that back to them. And so that was my first published book. I was the illustrator for it. And then that following fall, um, they asked, uh, myself and another illustrator from Greenville to come share our experiences at a SCBWI conference. So I thought, oh no, I have <laughs> online illustrations and a couple magazine ones and this book I don't even really know how to do. What am I going to talk about? So I was really panicking. And so I was asking people in some writer's groups online, you know, do you have any tips and things like that? And one of them said, oh, you need to contact this, it's another small publisher called Guardian Angel. Oh, they could really use your illustrations. And so with him, with this other illustrator, kind of recommended me. I got started with them. So, and they do royalty-based. So I've done a lot of books for them now. And they've published one of my stories. And I have one more coming out with them. And then my book over there is with Sylvan Dell. And I love their books. And I love doing animals. That's my favorite thing to draw. And so I always wanted to illustrate one of their books. And I would send her my samples about every year. Once a year, I just send her a reminder, remember me, remember me. And, um, and then I would send her a manuscript every once in a while. I, that was my fastest rejection ever was three hours. I sent her one feedback <laughs> three hours later saying sorry. But um, then finally, I did get one that, that they liked, and I illustrated it, and they published it. It came out in the fall. And then about a year ago, I, I have a friend who does work for a hire, which is when you write a book and they just pay you outright. There aren't any royalties. And they're usually nonfiction books. And so I started doing that about a year and a half ago, and I've done about 14? No. I did nine recently. And six more. So about 14 books that way, which are what I have up here to show you later. Um, and they're just nonfiction, and they're mostly for schools and libraries. So. Great. So that is a hugely diverse, you know, all of these women got to where they are sitting up here talking with you um, in hugely varied ways, which is, I think, um, a really great sort of element of this particular talk back right now. Um, I think also what's really interesting and really fantastic about this panel of women up here is also how diversified their writing is. Because, you know, you have the genre of children's literature, and um, I've seen in picture books, um, literature for younger children, there's young adult, um, but even within that, there are sort of sub-genres. So, um, Dinah, you write, um, you write nonfiction, you write sort of poetic, lyrical. Um, Kate sort of deals with, um, uh, we were, how, what did we say at dinner it was called? It was like um, creative biography or things based on family stories, pers very personal stories that she's sort of spun out into new stories. Um, Melinda writes, uh, you know, strictly fiction, um, and then Samantha is dealing a lot right now with educational materials and nonfiction, illustrating, you know, like she was talking about, like animals and things that libraries and schools are purchasing from her. So it's a huge genre, and I'm just wondering um, quickly again, sort of, but Dinah, start us out and talk about why you write what you write. Do you write for a particular, because you, you know, is, it, is there a particular, we talked about this word too, trend in publishing that you're trying to, or do you just write it from the heart and that's what's happening? Um, are you trying to, do you have a specific audience in mind or just children in general? How do you sort of, when you sit down, where do you start? Okay, first I want to just underscore a few things. If you're really serious, you should join the Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators. That's like the number one thing you must do. And the, the workshops are taught by professionals in the industry and often 
they will take submissions from members of that organization because they know you're serious. Because it's very difficult now to get your manuscripts through without an agent. But go to those conferences and it's worth your time. You learn a lot, you get to network. Um, and then what was your other question? Just about genre, about how. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, like Melinda was lucky that, that the timing of her pirate book worked with the trends, but I think it does, in general, you can't try to write to the trends. It doesn't make sense to do that. Because by the time you write to a trend, then the trend is over with. Um, so I think it's better just to write from your heart. Um, that's what I do, and it doesn't always work. Um, <laughs> if anyone saw the New York Times last week, there was a letter from Christopher Myers, whose father is Walter Dean Myers. Some of you probably know his name. But it was about the sad state of children's books by African American writers and illustrators. Um, so it's very, th this is very sad, right? Because my books might have a special message for African American audiences, but good literature is for every reader. That's what I think. Good literature is for all audiences. So I think you can get something out of any good piece of writing. So I think it's very sad that very often parents and teachers will not pick up books with black characters and hand them to non-black children. It does not make sense. So. Um, so read widely. That, that's the number one thing you have to do if you want to be a writer. You know, sometimes I'll ask my students, well, what have you been reading? Oh, I don't read, but, you know, tell me how I can get published. No, you cannot be a good writer if you're not a good reader. So I write about the things that are close to my heart. And my books happen in lots of different ways. I'm inspired in lots of different ways. Um, the first book I sold was called All Around Town, it was, and it was about the photographs of Mr. Richard Samuel Roberts, who was a Columbia photographer at the turn of the century. However, oh, that was the first one published, but it was the third one I got a contract for. It was the first one published because we were able to use his photographs instead of waiting for an illustrator to take years to do the illustrations. Um, the first person who illustrated for me was James Ransom. If you guys know children's books, you know that that is a real honor, but he had a long li list. Because the way illustrators work sometimes is that the publishers will buy their time years in advance. They'll figure, oh, in 2020, I'll have a book that I want this person to illustrate. Really, I'm not, I'm not joking you, right? So their, their time is booked up. And he jumped me ahead, and it still took years. So I had two books come out before that one came out. And there was something else I want to tell you that I can't remember. But I'm going to stop talking, and uh, <laughs> I'll remember. Well, I didn't know that about publishers buying time ahead of time um, uh, for, for illustrators. That must be for the really good illustrators. Oh, can uh, I say one more? Yeah. I just want to say one more thing about illustrating. We have an illustrator here. However, if you are not an illustrator yourself, don't go out and ask your friend who is an illustrator to illustrate your book because the editors don't like to be in the position of, for instance, liking your words but not liking the art. So they have illustrators they like to work with. So they may not even look at your submission if you pair it up. If you're a writer and an illustrator, you need to let them know that. But don't go look for your own illustrator who's your sister's best friend or something, don't do that. Thank you for saying that. Um, so many people do write something and think it needs to be illustrated before they can, they can uh, submit it to a publisher. When publishers have, they have editorial departments and they have art departments. And the art department's job is to work with illustrators. And the editorial department's job is to find writing that, that they want to publish. And uh, so if you've written something, just send that in. Um, okay, what am I supposed to be saying? Okay, so we were talking about, I, I mentioned you know, what publishers you're interested in, and you're a great person to talk about this, because you sort of, you know, well, you started your own publishing or imprint. What publishers are interested in? Um, well, I'll tell, you, I'll tell you 
the reason that we've done the books that we've done. Um, I, I did, as I said, the pink house, and it had a picture of, of a, a palmetto tree in it. And when I would do school visits, I would ask the children what, uh, what kind of tree that was, and they didn't know. And um, since they didn't know, I, I would try to tell them, and then I realized I didn't really know why the palmetto tree was our state tree and all that. And so I decided I would do the research and write a book about it. So I wrote Palmetto Symbol of Courage about how the palmetto tree became our state tree. And I, you always, when you're doing research for a book, you, you always find out more than you can possibly put into the book. And so when I do school visits, I tell a lot about, about the stuff that I found out that, that, that never got into the book. Um, and then, um, and after that, my, my son, my son who is an illustrator as well, I, now I'm, as a, as a cartoonist, I, I, I'm, you know, as a former cartoonist, I, I illustrated this book, but I think it's way too cartoony for a, a nonfiction book. I, I, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have made it this cartoony if I could have done more serious art. Um, my son, however, does beautiful serious art, and he did uh, the, he did the illustrations for Francis Marion and the Legend of the Swamp Fox. He had already done a, um, a. Um, documentary for ATV called Chasing the Swamp Fox, and he had illustrated it and co-produced it. No, co-wrote it. No, he wrote it. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> he, he wrote it and illustrated it. Anyway, I do know he did that. Anyway, his illustrations are beautiful in this book. And um, I was reading this book at a school visit, and this is, this is how I, I get ideas for my books, actually. Um, I, I was reading this book, and a child asked me if there were any black heroes of the American Revolution. And I said, well, that sounds like something I'd be interested in learning. So I did an awful lot of research for that, and I've got about 22 folks in here, and I've got, um, I tried to include people who I could find out what, what they were doing before the war, what they did during the war, and what happened to them after the war. So that's about 20, 22 um, people I have in here. Um, uh, there's only one woman, Phyllis Wheatley. Um, there, were, there were others, but I couldn't find out enough about those people to, to, um, to put them in the book. And then the, the next book, this was just something my son was interested in, and I got interested in it, and this is about uh, the Native Americans of South Carolina, first South Carolinians. We, we um, have just essentially done a lot of books about South Carolina. And um, they've turned out to be pretty popular, with, with, especially with the schools and the teachers and, and things. So that's, that's the only trend that we're working on right now is what, what, we, what we are interested in doing next. That's all. Because since we have our own publishing company, it'll get published. It, um, <laughs> you know. OK, Melinda. Thanks. Um, with fiction, um, you really can't predict the trend. I was lucky. I was fortunate. Um, there are people that try to predict the trend, and uh, then there are people that try to jump on the trend, like the Twilight books came out, and then everybody was writing a vampire book. Okay? So you can't necessarily jump on the trend, because um, like we said earlier, once you jump on it, it's gone. Um, you just have to write what you want to write. And for me, that's um, whatever occurs to me. I get ideas from a lot of different places. I love to tell the story. Uh, you know Helen Fellers. She is a wonderful person. She is a sweet, sweet lady. But I didn't know her well. When I first met her, uh, she was working at a Barnes & Noble in Greenville. And I had just found out that my first book was going to be published. And I also had uh, worked on the second book, and I had gotten a publisher to accept that, and was trying to think about a third one. Um, now, we were nowhere near being published on any of them, but we, I found out, and I was all excited. My husband and I were daydreaming in a store one day, and we were in the children's section saying, my book's going to be right there. You know? And uh, Helen was there, and she walked up to me, and she knew I was a writer because she knew Tom. And she said, you know, we don't get a lot of children's books about pirates. And at the time, that was true. And I thought, 
wow, I love pirates because I used to go out in the backyard and bury treasure, you know, like my mother's earrings and draw maps, you know. <laughs> and so I thought, this is a great thing. I can write about pirates. So I went home and wrote a pirate book. And, you know, seven years later, we had a pirate book on the shelves. And I, I, it was so funny because I ran into Helen later on uh, down in Columbia uh, at another bookstore. And we started talking. I said, wait a minute. You're Helen Fellers. And we started communicating. We've been great friends ever since. So it's really nice. But genre, with the genre of fiction and children's picture books, it's basically whatever stirs you. It's whatever makes you really want to write about. Um, we laugh about when Papa snores because somebody in my house snores, but it's me. And Tom and I used to sit around the kitchen table all the time when my kids were little. And we'd play this game. And he'd say, when your mother snores, the manhole covers outside bounce up and down. And I couldn't let him talk me, so I'd say, well, when your daddy snores, the people in the graveyard sit up and yell, be quiet. And Tom said, wouldn't that make a great book? And it did. Uh, it, it all depends on what you really like. Uh, I told you about Pirates Don't Change Diapers. Um, Hiccup Snick Up was a rhyme my grandmother taught me when I was a kid. Hiccup Snick Up, rear right straight up, three drops in the teacup will cure the hiccups. And you were supposed to say it three times, really fast. And you'd get rid of the hiccups. Well, nobody could ever do it, but it was, you know, it was fun to say. Uh, that's where that book came from. So there's always something that sparks a book in you. You write about what you want to write about. Don't try to predict because, believe me, it's not going to happen. Um, and the thing about illustrators, yeah, she's right. You, the, the Publishers want to see your writing, not your writing and the college kid down the street that happens to be good at drawing. Because children's illustration is an art form. It's something that, and, and you both know this, you have to really illustrate to make the story complete. It's not just drawing what's in the words. It's drawing something that makes the story complete and tells its own story. So it really does take a lot of talent to do. Um, what was our question? <laughs> oh, oh, what? Just the genre. And oh, then okay. I think that, you know, quick and we, after, yeah, after really brief. Okay, to mostly get to the what I write fictionally wise is picture books. And I did that with my kids in mind. They're my inspiration always in the, all my stories. Like the perfect pet, it's about a child who's trying to find the perfect pet. Well, that's my daughter, who's 15, who uh, went through every single pet there was and passed them all off on her brothers and sisters when they weren't the perfect one. So all of my stories do that. I have a, a bunch of home that are sitting in the drawers now that I have to send up. But there's one, uh, my girls, when they were little, they'd get up and their hair was all a mess and tangles. And so we made, together we made up a story called The Tangle Fairy, which actually someone's published that, but not the same story. So I'll have to get mine back out. And they actually helped me with the ending. Um, with that one, I'll tell you how I, I got that one, which was a little bit different, is that um, because I've written for so many magazines, when you write for magazines, you look on their guidelines, you see what they're interested in, and you write for that. You know, you write to this issue or that issue. Like I wrote one for squirrels about white, the white squirrels of Brevard for a squirrel issue and, and things like that. So with Sylvan Dell, because I've had, had some strikeouts there, and my last, my, my, my most recent one, I just got a quick email back saying, I'm going to have to pass, boo-hoo. And I thought, is she making fun of me? <laughs> but she wasn't. I think she was really sad. She couldn't take that one. But so I looked on their guidelines, and they were looking for something about animal classification. They're, they do fictional stories, but with the math or science bent. And so they wanted a story about animal classification. So I sat down and wrote one about animal classification, knowing that I like to draw animals. And I thought, well, this would be great, because I have lots and lots of animals. And um, I sent it in. It was one of the last two they were considering, and then they went with it. So for that one, it was sort of in the same way I... I would do magazines. I, I looked because some publishers say we are looking for this. And so they're looking for earth science. And one of the educational books I did recently was about volcanoes. So I have lots of volcanic information in my mind. So I'm thinking, how can I write a story about volcanoes that's interesting and maybe in rhyme because I like rhyming. So I'm still stuck on that one right now. Right. So and we talked about at dinner that when magazines sort of, when they list what they want, they're not kidding, that's really what they want. So that's a good place to start if you're sort of, you know, looking to get into the genre of magazine writing. Mm -hmm. um, and so that- But it can also work for picture books. Right. If there's a publisher that's a certain kind of picture books, sure. 
look and see what they're looking for. Great. Yeah, Diane. Can I, can I add a few things? I just want to respond to some things I just heard. Um, first, do not think that children's books should be written in rhyme. Rhyming books are some of the most difficult books to write. Also, don't go into children's books if you think children's books are where you start when you want to become a serious writer, because children's books are their own art form, as Melinda said. Um, so not just the art, but the writers um, as well. I mean, it's an art to write a children's book manuscript. Oh, okay, and the other thing I wanted to say is there are lots of different ways to generate writing. So usually people will tell you that the words come first and then the images, but that doesn't always happen. This, I'm just gonna show you one example. This is my book, Hair Dance, and the way this book happened was that the photographer sold the, her photographs to the publisher, and the publisher knows that I'm someone who likes to look at things, like Mr. Roberts' photographs, and write words. So she bought the photographs and then sent them to me, and I put them all around me and started writing, and that's how this book came about. So, so you often hear people say, no, the words have to come first, but not necessarily. That's great.